The seagulls are squawking overhead as a man with a steely-eyed look of determination stands at the bow of his ship. He looks over the gushing waters and sees a small speck of land in the distance. He looks back at his fleet of 300 ships and with a strong gaze he lets a smile creep across his face as he knows that that small speck of land which is only getting bigger by the second, his destiny awaits. Hello and welcome to the channel, I am That One History G and this is part number two of the Norman England story. In part number one we found out about the death of Edward the Confessor who died airless and perhaps under questionable terms. His closest living relative at that time was 14 years old, a boy who was completely looked over for the crown. In fact, there were three possibilities for the next king and they were contestants for this pageant of a crown. And if you haven't seen part number one yet, I suggest you go and watch that first. But let's get into it. Like I said, we had three contestants to the English crown. The not-so-royal Earl of Wessex, Harold Godwinson, who was Edward the Confessor's brother-in-law, and he had supported him throughout his reign. Now, Harold Godwinson had the support of the noble and the Witten as well. The Witten was a council of people who chose the next king, pretty much. They were like a parliament, an ancient version of a parliament. And he actually had crowned himself King of England the very next day after Edward had died, on the 6th of January, 1066. Contestant number two is Harold Hardrada, and we met him at the introduction of this video. He was the King of Norway, and he wanted the English crown to belong to a Scandinavian, just like it had done 60 years before. Finally, contestant number three, the very royal William, the Duke of Normandy, who was supported by the church at that time. And he claims that the old king, his friend and his distant cousin had promised him the throne. When Harold Godwinson had himself crowned on the 6th of January, 1066, the day after Edward the Confessor died, he knew that there was trouble coming his way. However, he was the richest person and most influential person in the entire country. He was the best England could offer. And he was a strong ruler after all. He had proved himself as the Earl of Wessex, as a strong and powerful ruler. But by July, he began to get nervous and started gathering troops around him. He and his troops even marched their way down to the south of England because they heard a rumor. Now this rumor was actually complete truth. William, the Duke of Normandy, had decided he wanted to make his claim for the English throne very real. And what he did was he started building fleets of ships in northern France, but William was in no rush to attack anyone. So he waited for the perfect moment to strike. The King of England, Harold Godwinson, and his troops waited for months for a possible invasion force that was going to come from the English Channel, but under a little bit of confusion, it never seemed to arrive. So, knowing that the harvest was nearing in on the farms, Harold Godwinson sent his troops home. He also didn't want to pay them without anyone coming. So, it was pointless having them there. So he sent his troops away to the farm so they could harvest the fields, because at the end of the day, these soldiers were mostly farmers. Harold Godwinson, on the other hand, went back to London. Now, finally, we get to Harold Hardrada, the King of Norway. He had been itching to get over to England ever since Harold Godwinson had made himself king, and he rarely wanted to make his own claim to the English throne. But it had been winter, and he wasn't willing to risk his fleet in the icy Scandinavian seas. But summer had arrived, and he had a chance to gather up all of his troops. He set out for England and arrived in England on the 18th of September, 1066, near a city called York, the northern stronghold. 
Harold Hardrada had one goal in mind, to become King of England, and his path was quite clear. First, he needed to take everything seriously, and to be taken seriously as well. And to do that, he knew he would have to take York. When he arrived in England, Hardrada was met with an ally who was waiting for him there. Of all people, the King of England, Harold Godwinson's younger brother, Tostig, had allied with Hardrada against his older brother because they had a rift in the family over his rule of an earldom. Harold Hardrada and Tostig went raiding and took control of towns as they sailed through the rivers in that area. Now news had eventually reached two young earls who lived in that area, the Earl of Northumbria and the Earl of Mercia, and they rushed to their countrymen's aid. By the 20th of September, the two Two sides met just south of York, and after four days of battle on the 24th of September, the two young earls of Mercia and Northumbria surrendered as they lost the Battle of Fulford, which is a town three kilometers south of York. With this victory, the town of York was Hardrada's. He had taken it, and he knew he had taken a step in the right direction as he edged closer to overall victory. He gained his troops and took them east of York and allowed them to rest while they sorted out the prisoners of war. Now we need to actually rewind to the 20th of September. Harold Hardrada had arrived, of course, and news had reached the king, Harold Godwinson, who knew the game was afoot and he had no time to lose, but he had dismissed his army already. Where was he going to get the manpower to win this fight? Well. He would simply have to gather it up on the way. He started the 180 mile north march immediately. And he sent for his fired troops in the shires to join him, as well as housecarls, which were professional Danish soldiers to join him. In total, he had an army of around 7,000 to 15,000 men, which actually isn't that many if you think about it. Now this 180 mile journey was tough, but luckily it was pretty direct as the Romans had built arrow straight roads centuries before when they conquered Britain. But this army just took four days to reach Tadcaster, which is a town just west of York. And they reached the town on the 24th of September, 1066, which was a truly Herculean effort. Godwinson knew his army would be exhausted, so he ordered them to rest for that night and gather their strength because they were going to need it. The combined forces of Hadrada and Tostig numbered 10,000 men. The next morning on the 25th of September 1066, as the sun rose and broke away the night's fog, scouts from King Harold Godwinson's army came back to report Harold Hadrada and Tostig's army were still waking up. Additionally, they were scattered around. Some were looking at the rivers, some were looking after the ships, and people had even left their armor on their ships to stow them away, away from the main camp. So perhaps now would be a perfect time to attack. Now, Harold Godwinson knew that if he was going to keep the English crown on his head, he'd have to attack when the army least expected it. These were battle-hardened Scandinavians on the other side. Harold Godwinson was all too aware of the dominance that the Norse had had over the English and the Anglo-Saxons over the past 300 years. Harold Godwinson used his advantage and he wanted to surprise the opposition army. So he got his army into lines and charged towards the unready Scandinavian army. Legend has it though, from an Anglo-Saxon chronicler, the English army arrived to a bridge of Stanford where there was one deranged Scandinavian warrior who was waiting for an entire army. The giant man with his behemoth battle axe repulsed wave after wave of attackers that were arriving on the bridge as he hacked down 40 Englishmen. Finally, the English started to fire arrows at this man, but still he stood. One brave English soldier even went underneath the bridge with his pike and stabbed the Scandinavian warrior into his groin. But still, the Scandinavian warrior stood. 
Eventually, as they neared towards him, they could see he was dripping in blood and they noticed he was actually dead. But the arrows that the English had flown at him were nailing him down and he was completely rigid because he was full of arrows. By this point, Harold Hardrada and Tastic had gotten their army into lines and they built a shield wall thanks to that deranged Scandinavian warrior who had given them enough time to do this. But some of them didn't even have their armor with them because they had left it in the boats because of the lack of space. They met the English army who slowly but surely pushed forward, taking each inch with blood. Hardrada was behind the battle line, shouting orders to his troops when a arrow striked him in the neck. This, of course, meant that he was drowning in his own blood, a horrific scene, and the Norse army seemed to be in trouble. They had just lost their king after all, but fortunately for them, Tostik was still in the army and he was leading his own troops. But eventually his personal bodyguards were overrun and his brother's army hacked him to death. The Norse army was now leaderless. The English were clearly ahead, but a reserve force who was looking after the longships came charging onto the battlefield. This relief force was completely outnumbered. They were led by Einstein Ori, a prospect son-in-law for Hadrada, who picked up his king's fallen banner and attempted to flank the English army. And for a moment, it seemed they may break the English line, but the brave Einstein Ori and his final charge was met with a sudden death. The English had won. The English warriors chased the remaining Norse warriors back to their boats and surrounded them. Surely this meant death for the Norse warriors who had fought so bravely. Even Harald Hardrada's younger son, Olaf, was part of the surviving group that is now surrounded. But Harald Godwinson and his army turned to chivalry and allowed the survivors to return to Norway peacefully. Only they would need to promise that they would never return again. They came to England with 300 ships, but they only needed 24 to leave. This is a real significant moment because one of the contestants for the English crown had just been killed by another. This is even more significant because it's the real last attempt for any Scandinavian force to take the English crown. I say real attempt because there was one other small force that attempted this years on, but it was rather insignificant and made no damage at all. The King of England, Harold Godwinson, was on the up. He was proving a fine leader and he was the best option England had to be king. He had just beaten back an entire Viking invasion. His troops believed in him and he was really gathering strength as the entire country began to rally behind him. But the war wasn't over yet. He had another contestant for the English throne to deal with and time was ticking. William, the Duke of Normandy, with a massive fleet, had just embarked on a journey that would change the tides of history. Find out what happens next in part number three. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you want to watch in the future by commenting down below. Like, comment, subscribe, the more you know.